Pretty dissonant stuff, huh? Uh, one of my one of my friends, Larry Barron, our uh, our famous IGC cameraman, sent me a, a memo the other day about, hey, do you have any records by any albums? What do we call them nowadays? By John Fahey. I said, yeah, probably thirty. He goes, can I borrow some? And I said, why do you ask about John Fahey? And he said, well, it was, I uh, ran into this podcast that I will have a link to, but it was uh, uh, interesting comments about Fahey. So, so Fahey's been on my mind. I've even got my John Fahey book out here that right now it's sitting under a pile of things somewhere. But, because uh, one of my students spends a lot of time playing, oh, by the way, it's May 31st. We are at the end of five months of 2019. And it has been a really hectic couple of weeks, going back to a couple of weeks ago around here. Things should be calming down a bit, but have not been getting as much done as I would like. Certainly not as much playing as I would like. But Fahey was a strange character. Well, let me give you, let me, I'll come back to the John Fahey story in a minute. Um, let's talk about what happened here first at TG. I have a couple of things I want to talk about, a couple songs, uh, some bar chord tips, and uh, oh, the beautiful saddest thread. I, I just have a couple of thoughts on that. I'm not going to go too far into it right now. It's too, it's, oh man. is one I would throw in to the running for the most beautiful. When I think about the most beautiful songs, I guess I'm going to go into this now. I was going to save it for later, and I was actually going to try to think about it while I was rambling through whatever else I was going to talk about today. But that, now the other one. English. Classical themes, one was by um, Borodin, Borodin, Antonin, I think his name was, and the other is by Holst, Gustav Holst from the 20s, who kind of just wrote as a little sideline. I think he was like really an English professor or something, but two of my favorite tunes, Jupiter and one of the Polovetsian dances, which later became, later got used as a, uh, became a popular song, Stranger in Paradise. Okay, too early to weigh in on the saddest, but there are two of my candidates for the most beautiful. I, again, I think of instrumentals when I think of that. Um, what did I really want to talk about? We had a few new tunes this week. Um, we had, oh, I don't think I can fake my way through this. Max brought us It Don't Mean a Thing, classic jazz standard jazz tune from the 40s, I'm guessing. Maybe, I think, anyway. And then another one, a West Montgomery tune, working on play, learn, learning to play stuff using Wes had a great sound using octaves in his lead playing, so that was pretty neat. And then we had another entry in the Steely Dan world, uh, Dirty Work. So I want to thank Max for picking up the whole ball this week as the other two of us were a little bit out of commission. Um, what did go on uh, in the month of May in, in uh, the Hogan family? We have four consecutive birthdays, all a week apart. This this year, well, it's always the 7th, 14th, 21st, and 28th. And 28th mm -hmm. is my dear wife, Nani's, and uh, the whole family went to Hamilton on the 29th. Day in San Francisco, 10-hour outing, 10 of us went. It was pretty cool. 
if you get a chance and decide you can you want to splurge on something ridiculously expensive it's it's way worth it so cool tunes i might even have to look into um I should figure that out. I did a lesson. I, I, one of my students worked on Burn from that a long time ago, but uh, tear jerking moment in the play in the in the show. Um, anyway, Hamilton is really cool. Got to admit, it's got me reading up. I, I've spent a lot of time uh, in the past mostly researching English, British, Irish history, but now I'm going to start checking out more of the uh, American history. It's a little too modern for me, but uh, that's uh, pretty fascinating. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Hint on bar chords. One of my, one of our students from IGC Europe, Eric, was saying that he has been having a, he's making a little bit of progress with his B minor. And what I wanted to do was reiterate some really important B minor bar chord thoughts. When you're practicing bar chords, a couple things. Good hand position, thumb down low, room for a cigar in, in the palm of your hand, maybe even a golf ball. And, um really close to the fret don't let the bar be back like this don't let your finger be curled up don't you know then really nice arches on the fingers really close to the frets and the best exercise you can do for getting better at bar chords is not wrestling with it till every note sounds good and using every every half of muscle every muscle in this half of your body it won't work get it in position just make it look good and don't put any pressure on it yet get your hand in that position it should sound like this and then squeeze it and pump it and hope that it sounds like that and do like a hundred of those never letting go of the strings just squeezing really hard this is to build up the muscles to get there then the next step would be take them a little further off try to take them a quarter of an inch off the strings and keep them in that formation and then put them back on so you get way more bang for your buck here doing this, then doing this, and, and trying to get everything to sound really good. F sharp minor seven would be another good one to, do, to work on because it only takes one finger on the fourth fret of the A string and the full bar of the second. Could even do it, you don't really even need to have any of the fingers down, but it's not, it's difficult to get all six notes. I'm squeezing really hard there to get all six of those notes clean. Luckily, you rarely ever need all six notes clean, so don't don't worry about that too much. Anyway, um, practice Roxanne. It's a built-in exercise. So um, that's it. That's my bar chord wrap for today. I want to talk about, oh, okay, I'm going to go into the saddest thing for just a second because we kind of have to rank tragic or sad events before we can like even pick out the saddest song. So on one hand, there's the story, uh, the taxi story. Should have thought about this. Okay, guy loses the girl. That's bad. There's the A Star is Born story. A little more tragic. There is the, um, what was the next one I was going to think of? There's the Cleopatra and Mark Antony, Romeo and Juliet kind of story. That's a little more, that's even a step more tragic than that, because I think. Um, but when it comes to... Nothing beats that one. Not just the song. The topic. So, if we're looking for saddest stuff, I think I think Craig hit it on the head there. With it's it's uh, um, anyway. Enough. It's been, a, it's been an emotional week around here anyway. Between birthdays, Hamiltons, graduations, memorial services. Um, but along that line, I, I threatened to talk more about John Fahey. huge influence on me when I first and I think the first thing I heard of his oh I know the first thing I heard was um, uh, no it wasn't this it was Beverly
which I, I sometimes get confused with this song that I was going to try to play because one of my students has been working on it lately. So let me divert into Some Summer Day. cool tune that you can uh, mix and match and do all kinds of weird things. Um, anyhow, that's that's about all I wanted to talk about, but I did want to, I haven't shown you this guitar for a long time, but I have it sitting right here, my John Fahey Special, which is now 99 years old. This is the Hawaiian guitar made in Los Angeles. And I'm in a Hawaiian tuning right now, which I have never played in. I just have a student working on it. So this is a C6 tuning. I have C, E, G, A, C, E. That's six chord. See, does that just bring up waves and... I told you this story before, but it's been years. Um, I had seen Fahey play this exact guitar called a Kona, K-O-N-A, um, or and there's even a picture of it on a couple of his album covers. I think the Essential John Fahey has one, the Vanguard album. But uh, at a store that I was teaching at in, when I was a teenager, the first store I ever taught at, they were going, uh, they were closing the store and going out of business, and. I stopped in and he was cleaning out the shop and this was up in a corner and he had just paid me $60 that I was a fortune, of course, back then. This was 1975 probably. And, uh, and so, uh, John, the owner of the store, he was, he was about to pack this up and I saw it, you know, up in the rafters. I said, hey, what, what's the story on that guitar? I think it was marked for like $200. And I thought, oh man, I can, there's no way I can, I can't spring $200 for a guitar like that. And so I said, John, what are you going to do with that guitar? He says, well, tell you what, you want it for a hundred bucks? I said, 
that was exactly how much I had. I had 40 walking into the store. And that was for, like for groceries and a week's rent, you know. Um, and so I decided I could live without groceries and the rent and snag this guitar. And I've now had it for, what? what is that, 25 and almost 20, almost 40, like 40. Yep, that's about it. About almost 45 years. And uh, I put a lot of, it, it had a lot of cracks in it and stuff, all koa. Um, you can see the body joins the neck at the 7th fret. You can probably see the height of the strings, too. It's built to be a lap steel guitar. So, okay, that's, my, that's the end of my John Fahey story. And the end of May. I will have more next week.